Additionally, the research says that men need to be more picky on dating apps and women need to be less picky on dating apps. Don't be afraid to move on from match matches that do not meet the criteria that align with your intentions. Welcome back to the Challenger Podcast. I am so excited to be hosting this episode from the brand new house, brand new office. So a quick life update before I dig into a lot of great topics for today's episode. Uh, you know, my partner, Teresa, and I moved into our new home a couple of weeks ago, which is why there uh, was an absence of a couple of episodes over the last few weeks. Glad to be back. Super excited for the next stage and the next, you know, phase of the podcast and what it's going to look and sound like. I'm super excited about bringing on new types of guests. Absolutely. Next week, I'm going to be joined by a former client of mine, uh, Kyle. He's an expert in handstand coaching. He and his partner just recently moved to Las Vegas, bought a house. So I thought that we could actually dig into those life transition phases together on the podcast. So hit subscribe so you don't want to miss next week's episode with Kyle Weiger. We're also going to talk about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and things that he's super passionate about, as well as current events in the world. So don't forget to hit subscribe so that you don't miss out on the next few episodes because they're going to be great. Uh, back to that life update, you know, the house has been an adventure and it's a huge responsibility to take on. Um, you're happy to support anybody who's going through it because there were a lot of unexpected, uh, you know, unknown costs and unexpected, un um, unknown costs and expectations when it comes to purchasing your first home. It is not for the faint of heart. You need to be extremely resilient when you go through the negotiation phase, the closing phase, and then finally the move, which ultimately has become, uh, you know, just an opportunity to get to know each other better in our relationship because a lot of stuff comes up when you're doing a high stress life event like a move. On top of the last year, uh, job loss, job change, new jobs, a move, a home purchase, all of those things stacked on top of each other would require a lot of resiliency. And it reminds me a lot of being single and how resilient you need to be when you're out there facing rejection. Rejection is never easy, whether it be put in an offer on a house and it gets denied, it gets rejected, or it gets like a big counter offer. You know, I think we went really low on our home offer price, maybe 35,000 less than asking. And then they kind of stood firm on asking price. We countered with a $10,000 discount plus a two in one buy down, which saved us $25,000 overall. So what if we had gone through that process and been rejected and then given up? It reminded me a lot of how approaching modern dating requires you to be resilient. You face a lot of rejection when you're out there on dating apps, putting yourself out there. Maybe you're looking for uh, a serious relationship and the people that you're matching with are only looking for casual. And that's what I want to talk about on today's podcast episode, plus so much more. We're going to cover uh, how the Enneagram type four would want to choose their hinge prompts from a self-deprecating way, but also in an authentic way. So I'm going to cover... Uh, how to set your intentions in modern dating when you're online dating apps. And then we're going to transition into hinge prompts for the type four Enneagram, the individualist of which I've had a few podcast guests of type four on the podcast in the past. The type four is not one to put themselves out there publicly. So I interviewed my good friend Shelly on the topic of friendship and how we've maintained a relationship and friendship for 20 years. Uh, through her marriage and through uh, her experience of raising a son, all with ulcerative colitis, right? So if you didn't check out that episode, super unique story, grateful for an Enneagram individualist to come on, put themselves out there on the podcast and uh, share their story with the world. So those are two topics that I want to discuss as well as we're going to we're going to talk some shit about the presidential debate that happened a couple of weeks ago. So stay tuned. Those are the three major topics of conversation that we want to have today. As always, if you're looking for a little bit more support in your relationship and dating journey, 
don't hesitate to reach out, connect with me on Instagram, the challenger podcast, or on TikTok at dave.blazer, right? Connect with me, shoot me a private message, and we'll get the conversation going about what's coming up for you in your own dating and relationship journey right now. Without further delay, let's get into the topics of the day. I'm super excited to bring you a topic I absolutely have enjoy talking about over the past five or six years of hosting the podcast, how to set your intentions in dating. Setting intentions when dating online is the most important step to ensure that you are clear about what you're looking for and you're clear when you match with other people, as well as how to attract potential matches who are aligned with those goals and intentions. The following tips on how to set your intentions, um, I compiled it over the past five or six years of doing my own trial and error, but also helping people navigate online dating when they are frustrated with not getting aligned matches on Tinder, Hinge, Bumble, all of the other apps out there. And we'll kick it off right now. So number one, most important thing, reflect on your goals. Take some time to think about what you are looking for in a relationship. Are you looking for something casual, a serious commitment, companionship, or just to make new connections. All of the above are completely acceptable goals and intentions when you're online dating. The difference is how you show up and how you communicate those intentions. Are you forthcoming or are you reserved? Are you showing up authentically or are you hiding your true intentions? Understanding your goals is key to setting intentions in online dating. Number two, be clear in your profile. Make sure that your online dating profile reflects your intentions. Mention what you were looking for in a partner or relationship so that potential matches can understand your goals from the beginning. There's a theory out there. It's called the haystack theory where uh, women were frustrated with uh, building online profiles, spending time online dating, and not getting quality matches. And the matches were being drawn to a generic profile, something that just wasn't clear, something that wasn't clearly stating intentions. So the haystack theory basically is like, let's put out the most abrasive and almost bitchy profile to weed out the weak. This is a particular technique that is like laws of attraction, where strength attracts strength. What comes up for me, though, when I research the haystack method and the haystack theory of modern dating is that there are two types of people you might attract when you're putting out a profile that's abrasive. It's all of like the things you don't want in your profile versus the things that you do want that are going to attract an ideal partner based on your values. So when I was doing the research, it, it definitely reminded me of a couple of types of people online dating that you might attract with the haystack theory. The first one is like a person who has prove it energy. Oh, well, this profile, while I'm not necessarily attracted to anything in it, I need to prove it to myself or the other person that I'm good enough by going after and chasing this person. It would kind of inspire a lot of like making choices and behaviors and decisions from your wounded self. And I don't encourage anyone to, one, put up so many abrasive walls in your online dating profile that would you know, attract a prove it type of a person. The other person that it might attract is almost like the overly dominant. Oh, well, this person needs to be put in their place. This person needs to be taught um, something, a lesson, or uh, they need to be shown that you can't act. Like it, there's a lot of negativity that shows up for me when I was reading and researching the haystack theory. So if you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to reach out because I can get be, be a little bit clearer, maybe on a future episode. Uh, back to the topic of the day, though, because I think it's really important. Step number three, communicate openly. When you start talking to someone online, be open and honest about your intentions from the start. It's important to communicate clearly to avoid misunderstandings later on. You're going to uh, prevent getting hurt if you're more clear up front. You're going to self-advocate more often. You're going to earn the other person's respect, whether it goes to a relationship or not. Not only that, but you're going to build self-respect along the way if you clearly communicate what your intentions are and you don't deviate from them 
uh, because you like this person or because you think that they're above you or when you're making decisions from that place, you oftentimes shrink and play small and don't communicate in a way that's authentic. Number four, set boundaries. It's boundaries are like the key component of modern dating, right? Establish boundaries early on in your interactions with people online. Let your potential matches know what you are comfortable with and what you are not willing to compromise on. First dates should not be at the other person's house. That's a clear boundary that is completely understandable. If you disagree with it, totally fine. Reach out, tell me why, and we'll have a great conversation about why. But this is one that uh, certainly I hear a lot of people complain about. Oh, their first date, they wanted me to come over to their place. I don't know you. I'm not going to your place. First date, right? I'm not going to have dinner and a movie, Netflix and chill on the first date. Got to treat me with respect and setting boundaries shows other people that you respect yourself. And you're also respecting them by setting boundaries, by teaching them um, how you allow others to access you, right? Access your time, access your energy, access your physical boundaries, et cetera. Number five. Stay true to yourself. While it's important to be open to new experiences, it's also crucial to stay true to your values and goals. Do not feel pressured to change your intentions just to please someone else. There's more on self-advocacy in the later part of the episode when we talk about the presidential debate. But if you're looking for a little bit more strategies on how to advocate for yourself, check out last week's episode. Staying true to yourself is a reminder that your boundaries are healthy. If you're choosing healthy boundaries that align with your values and you stay true to yourself, you're going to, one, improve uh, self-respect and you're going to earn respect from other people, whether that's at work, in family, in relationships, and so forth. When you stay true to yourself and your values, you are self-advocating for yourself each and every day. Next step, evaluate your matches. Be very selective when you're online dating. As you interact with different people online, assess whether they align with your intentions and goals. Read their profile. Don't just make the decision based on the picture. You know, uh, the research says that women's profiles have pictures that kind of bump up their attractiveness, while men choose pictures that actually downplay their attractiveness. So be very, very intentional when it comes to evaluating your matches. What do they say in their profile? Um, how are they acting in those pictures? Not so much what they look like, because we don't want to necessarily bring our lizard brain into the choices that we're making in online dating, just based on their attractiveness. As you interact with different people online, assess whether they align with your intentions and goals. Did they put in their profile what they're looking for? Does like attract like? Are you evaluating their profile as much as they're evaluating yours, if not more so? Additionally, the research says that men need to be more picky on dating apps and women need to be less picky on dating apps. Don't be afraid to move on from matches that do not meet the criteria that align with your intentions. And finally, this is probably the most important piece. One of the things that I learned along the way is how I understood and how I learned what staying true to myself and what healthy boundaries means to me was through choosing an embodiment practice. Tapping into your body's natural instincts and intuition will inform you of your truth deter to determine if you're aligned with your decision. My embodiment practices include jujitsu, um, daily meditation through breath work. I do three rounds of 30 breaths with holds in between. That helps me push my edge. But while I'm doing that, I'm also tuning into how my body is feeling. Do I feel the pressure of the day? Do I feel the pressure of decisions that I've made recently? Do I feel the pressure of conflict coming up at work, in relationships, or uh, in family? Some examples of an embodiment practice for you might be yoga, martial arts, journaling, breath work, cold plunges, and meditation. What is your go-to embodiment practice, and what do you see as a result from long-term discipline? It's not just one day of yoga that's going to help you tune into what your boundaries are and how you're going to stay true to yourself. It's a lifelong discipline. So what do you choose to do in your daily, weekly, monthly practice that you have been maintaining over the long term that includes discipline? Motivation is what gets us started. Discipline is what keeps us going. 
Discipline teaches us how to maintain our boundaries. Discipline teaches us when and how to stay true to ourselves when we're out there dating in the modern world. So in summary, by setting clear intentions when online dating, you can increase your chances of finding someone who's on the same page as you to create more meaningful connections. If you're looking for a little bit more support in that part of your life right now, don't hesitate to reach out on TikTok and Instagram. Let's move on to uh, hinge prompts for the Enneagram 4. And I'm going to post these memes both online on Instagram and here on YouTube so that you can view what I'm narrating, right? But I'll read them uh, really quick. I've got nine here for you. The hinge prompt starts with, I'll know it's time to delete hinge when that's the prompt. And here's the answer. I have found someone that appreciates my dark sense of humor. The Enneagram for the individualist has a very unique self-deprecating sense of humor. And why I love the discussing and topic, talking about the Enneagram 4 is as a challenger, the 8, when I am feeling my best, when I am showing up as my most authentic self, I actually resemble this type of the Enneagram 4 because of the way that uh, we trend on towards integration. As an 8, I go towards the best parts of the 2, which resemble the 4. I can show up with very healthy, self-deprecating humor. I think that's why the TikTok page, the TikTok account grew so quickly after that breakup because it was a place where I could go, have self-deprecating humor and heal by putting myself out there. And again, the Enneagram 4 is not somebody who is brave when it comes to social media. It takes a lot of work to put themselves out there in an authentic way on social media. As the individualist, their core, um, their core motivation is to feel seen and understood as the unique individual that they are. However, they their path to growth is by doing that, by taking action, by actually putting themselves out there in their most authentic version of themselves. If that resonates with you, then you might be a four. So tune in to the rest of these hinge prompts for the type four. We're the same type of weird if we put aside all responsibility for a day and meander through the deep expanse of our hidden and heavy conversations. That is quintessential type four individualist language. You and I were the same type of weird if we put aside all responsibility for a day, say like a Sunday, and meander through the deep expanse of our hidden and heavy conversations. Two Enneagram fours or one Enneagram four that's leading the conversation can go deep. They can get dark and they can be almost like extremely curious about the universe and death and uh, the what if scenarios in the world. Not so much catastrophizing them, but they definitely love that dark side of what if scenarios and they love to dig deep into that conversation. So if you're the same type of weird, you might be an Enneagram four. The hinge prompt next. I recently discovered that my unique gift to this world is my greatest strength. This is the most authentic, integrated version of the Enneagram 4. When they come to understand that their unique gift in this world is their greatest strength, they're able to lean into it, show up as that version of themselves, and completely own it. They have no shame. They have no fear. They have no reservations about putting themselves out there, which is why I love this type of the, this version of the four, because I can resonate when I go to my most integrated self. That's how I show up. I know that I'm showing up aligned when I post on social media because it has my true authentic self. And that is the, the type four. It's a little self-deprecating. It's also ownership. When I can fully ownership all of that, which I have shame around or fear around, or I don't want other people to judge me for, that's when I'm showing up as my best version as the challenger. And this is how we can learn so much about ourselves through the Enneagram. The Enneagram teaches us through the way of self, uh, self-awareness, uh, reflections from others, and it's shadow work. What are the deepest, darkest recesses of our shadow that we don't want other people to see? The Enneagram is going to expose that. The next hinge prompt for the Enneagram type four is I'm weirdly attracted to the lead singer of the most obscure emo band that broke up 10 years ago. I'm just going to let you sit with that one here for a moment. 
I'm weirdly attracted to the lead singer of the most obscure emo band that broke up 10 years ago. And what does that tell you about the Enneagram 4? They're holding on to a time in their past that they just felt so uh, alone or so tuned into the um, emotions of the day or emotions of the time period. And that would uh, tend to draw them towards other people who are experiencing the same thing. So the lead singer of the most obscure emo band that hasn't done a show in 10 years is exactly who the Enneagram type four is attracted to. The next hinge prompt for the Enneagram type four, the hallmark of a good relationship is deep, intense conversations that last for hours and discover the darkest recesses of our souls. And this is slightly different than the one that I shared with you earlier about the dark conversations. Those dark conversations I talked about earlier could happen with anyone, a best friend, a coworker, a therapist, uh, another, the lead singer of that band. But this particular prompt draws us into what the Enneagram type four is looking for in a relationship. They choose their partner by how deep and intense those conversations can be, right? So if an Enneagram type four doesn't set their intentions on on their profile when they're online dating, then they're going to end up with people who cannot hang with them on the deep, intense conversations that can last for hours. The Enneagram 4 thrives on that intense conversation that brings in the what-if scenarios of the world or of their experience or of their soul, right? So if that resonates with you, you might know a 4 or you might be a 4. Now, as I round this out, we're going to go with Unusual skills. This is a hinge prompt that can be a great conversation starter. What unusual skills as the Enneagram 4 can you think of right now? I'm the best at making every situation just a little bit more awkward. You'll be asking yourself, did they really just say that out loud? And again, this is the self-deprecating humor of an integrated 4. They might also be doing it from a place of shame as well or a place of fear. But honestly, if you can stay engaged with an Enneagram 4 after they say something awkward in a public situation, a conversation at a dinner party, or like, hey, we just met, but I shared something that came from my childhood that was trying to tie together the conversation that makes people awkward laugh, you're in the presence of a 4. But they view this as one of their unusual skills. They actually kind of thrive off of either poking at other people with their awkwardness or they're leaning into their awkwardness through self-deprecating humor. So I hope that resonates and I hope that stands out to you as a four. The secret to getting to know me is really listen to my embarrassing stories. I'll overshare on our first date, trust me. So if you're hearing awkward stories, if you're hearing embarrassing stories, that can tell you a couple of things about your date. If they're an Enneagram four, they either feel really comfortable with you and they're joking and they're bringing that self-deprecating humor, or they're trying to push you away. They're putting up a wall with the same exact behavior. And that is the beauty of the Enneagram is that it can show us exactly our truest self and our worst version of ourselves with the same behavior. We just have to understand what the motivation is behind that behavior. If we're doing it in a self-deprecating way to connect with other people, you might be a little bit more integrated. If you're doing it to scare people off or push people away, you might be a little bit of your disintegrated self. And that's the beauty of the Enneagram. It can show you exactly who you are in the moment. And we can range between the higher levels of health and the lower levels of health all in the same day through how we show up in the world. Up next, a shower thought I recently had. If Goldilocks tried three beds, then Mama and Daddy Bear slept separately. Baby Bear is probably the only thing keeping that family together. I don't recall where I was at in the world when I wrote these hinge prompts, but it was definitely COVID because I was doing the Believe, Be Real, Be Bold podcast regularly, like twice a week. I loved it. It was one of my projects during COVID. And if I was in a dark place that day when I wrote a shower thought I recently had, and the answer is, if Goldilocks tried three beds, then Mama and Daddy Bear slept, slept separately. Baby Bear is probably the only thing keeping that fam family together. And I want to acknowledge who I got that from. It's at Gridster2. So I have this in quotes because I definitely borrowed it from somebody else. 
but I thought that it exemplified the Enneagram four perfectly. So if that made you chuckle, if that made you laugh, we might have the same type of sense of humor. And I want to hear more from you. So if that resonated, reach out, let me know how that landed with you as an Enneagram type four. Finally, my simple pleasures in life, calling in sick to work, spending a rainy weekday journaling random thoughts, and then reading them to myself and acknowledging that I'm destined to be alone for the rest of my life. Now that response to that hinge prompt pulls in all of the versions of the four, right? They're going to call in sick to, to work when they have an emotional day. They're going to spend a rainy weekday journaling random thoughts and then never read it again or read it again in 10 years and be like, oh, I can tune into that exact emotion that I was feeling in that moment. And it'll take them back to what they were wearing, where they were sitting, what they were listening to and what journal, uh, what journal prompt they were using. And then reading them to myself and acknowledging I'm destined to be alone the rest of my life. And that brings in a lot of one self-deprecating humor, but also a lot of that depressed energy or that uh, negative energy that the four can bring to their own life existence, right? And that's not such a bad thing because they're living in this world with self, self, such self-awareness, but also so much self-judgment that they can get caught up and they can get tricked up, tripped up into believing their own narrative and their own false narrative about themselves as well. And that's why when the Enneagram type four starts to isolate, it can be a very challenging thing. The Enneagram type four needs to understand that when they choose isolation, they're choosing to amplify all of the shadow that's in their life. So if you're an Enneagram four and you're looking for a little bit more support in your life and relationship and work, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here for you because I can relate big time to the, uh, that last point that I shared. Now let's talk some shit. Uh, if you watched the presidential debate a few weeks ago, you might have been let down. You might have been coming away, walking away from that presidential debate saying, these are our two choices, because that was a train wreck. And I'm going to share some a personal connection that I have to the debate, as well as a lot of perf uh, like objective observation, right? Now, I want to preface this next section where we talk some shit about current events in the world that endorsing Biden isn't a Trump versus Biden debate. It's an easy decision between two administrations. And today we're going to compare the Trump administration, the four years under Trump, and we're going to compare what is almost a full four-year term for Biden. Because the president does not do it alone unless you're coming from a perspective of an authoritarian dictatorship, which I talked about a few weeks ago in the episode about you might be in a cult. So let's just kick off this comp uh, comparison of the debate. Did Biden have a great debate? No. Did Trump have a great debate? Absolutely not. His was actually worse because uh, they counted over 30 lies during the, during the debate. One of the drawbacks of the debate is that they weren't live fact-checking. The moderators did a very poor job of, of checking Trump on his lies and also Tr uh, Biden too. Like if you read the uh, post-debate fact-checking from Politico, which is where I got my research, you'll understand that Biden also told some mostly false statements in there as well. And as I've been doing my research, becoming more informed as an American citizen to help me make the best decision now that we have this huge investment of a home, now that uh, my partner and I are uh, gaining direction and, and focus in our lives of what we want it to look like, we need to become more informed in the current events because it helps us inform who we're going to choose that is leading the economy, leading our democracy in the next four years. So that's why the conversation is so important to bring it back to why. The values that align with my in gaining information in the current events of the day comes from a place of self-advocacy. I need to advocate for myself because of what we just purchased, because of where we're going in our lives, and because of how I want my life to look. And I could bring that self-advocacy into any area of my life. I can bring it into my relationship. I can bring it into my leadership. I can bring it into my business ownership. I can bring it into my coaching business as well. 
if I show up advocating for myself, then my clients are going to as well. And if they have challenges with advocating for themselves, then we can walk them through the step-by-step process that it takes to develop more resiliency when you are putting yourself out there and advocating for what you believe in that's aligned with your values. So let's just cover the Trump administration first from 2017 to 2021. And I will bring in a little bit more information from before Trump was elected president because context matters. And it, as a reminder, context does not excuse behavior. So the Trump administration compared to the Biden administration. And that's how we're going to talk some shit today. Trump had 4,000 lawsuits or more and court cases against him or his companies. That was before he became president. And now we know about his current status as a convicted felon in New York with three other pending indictments that unfortunately the Supreme Court has delayed. And that's reality. That's not hyperbole. That is a real statistic that we can uh, search the New York docket and locate how many lawsuits have been filed by Trump and filed against Trump in Florida, California, New York, and even now in the United Kingdom with his uh, golf courses that he can no longer run. Because when you're a convicted felon in Scotland, you, one, you're not allowed in the country, and two, you can't own these businesses. They're going to snatch them back from you. That's how other countries operate that's a little bit different than America. Before Trump was elected president, he switched from Democrat to Republican and back again. Trump registered as a Republican in Manhattan in 1987. Since that time, he has changed his party affiliation five times. In 99, Trump changed his party affiliation to the Independence Party of New York. In August 2001, Trump changed his party affiliation back to Democratic. In 2000, September 2009, Trump changed his party affiliation back to the Republican Party. In 2011, December of that year, Trump changed his changed to no party. <laughs> Trump changed to no party affiliation, which makes him an independent. In April of 2012, Trump again returned to the Republican Party. So I'll read this quote quickly. In 2004 interview, Trump told CNN's Wolf Blitzer, "In many cases, I probably identify more as a Democrat." Explaining, it just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. Now it shouldn't be that way, but if you go back. I mean, it just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats, but certainly we had some very good economies under Democrats as well as Republicans, but we've had some pretty bad disaster under the Republicans. And in a July 2015 interview, Trump said that he has a broad range of political positions that I identify with some things as a Democrat. So here's a clip of what he actually thinks. And it just seems that the economy does better under the Democrats than the Republicans. Now, it shouldn't be that way, but... We've had some pretty bad disaster under the Republicans. What do you think of that clip? I mean, he's basically saying, I know how to take advantage of the Republican Party. And is that somebody that we want leading the Republican National Committee? Right? The Republican National Party is led by a person who thinks that of the party. Based on current events, he wants to keep it that way. He put his daughter-in-law as co-chair of the Republican National Committee because he knows that she's never he's she will never allow it for him to be replaced on the ballot, right? So there's a lot of behavior that aligns both with how Trump ran his businesses, how Trump ran his uh, his administration between 2017 and 2021, and that now how he's behaved ever since. So there's some food for thought when it comes down to the debate that we most recently saw between the two people. Over 30, I'll get to this in a minute, but over 30 lies were documented in Trump's side of the debate. That's one every 90 seconds. All right, back to the topic at hand, though. Let's compare the administration. I have four more points here. Trump was twice impeached as president. And if it weren't for the process it takes to impeach, it would have been completed because there was enough evidence and there was enough momentum moving forward to complete those twice impeached. But somebody stepped in, saved him. I'll save the white privilege. I'll save the Christian nationalist conversation for another day. But it's part of our current events. It's part of reality for where we're at right now. 
in the world. And it truly makes a, uh, it truly makes a difference how you show up in November, how I show up in November, how I influence my circle of influence, right? A circle of uh, influence right now. Can I influence my partner? She influences me as well. She helps open my perspective on Israel and Palestine be by becoming a little bit more uh, globally sensitive and not such a centralist. I think that's a great way to be influenced in life. But back, I got off track a little bit there. I got off topic a little bit there because I do care about this topic. And that's why I feel like it's really important to discuss now, especially more now than ever before. And if you join me on TikTok, you'll see that I'm beginning to post a little bit more um, authentically and a little bit more assertively on TikTok about what's going on in the world because it truly puts things into perspective. While I love talking about the Enneagram, modern dating and relationships, it really puts it into perspective that how the hell am I going to maintain a business after November if I just let everyone else decide? And if that doesn't resonate with you, then I, I feel like we can have a conversation about self-advocacy. That is how I show up for myself. That is how I advocate for what I believe in and what is important to me. My new home is important to me. My relationship is important to me. My business is important to me. My quality of life is important. And that's what I'm advocating for on TikTok and here on the, on the podcast now. All right, three more uh, facts about the administration to compare. Trump has 34 felonies in New York. The lower court, which is known as the Supreme Court in New York, is rigged according to Trump. And if that's the case, then how can the appeals court in New York be trusted so much by Trump, who says, we'll win on appeal, which is how he's approaching all of these indictments across the country. But he has been convicted in New York, but then he says he's going to rely on the appeals process in the um, appellate court of New York oh, but we'll win on appeal is a major contradiction of language to bash the judicial process in the lower court, which is known as the Supreme Court in New York, while relying heavily on appeals, Supreme Court of the United States. If we're always going to the appellate division to rely on the trust of the judicial process, then something is wrong in your process of how you're approaching the lower court. One thing cannot be rigged and then the second step in the process being fully trusted when you win, right? So some people call the 34 felonies in New York a witch hunt just to keep him off the ballot. And I adamantly stand firm that is 100% a result of Donald Trump's choices in 2016 to cover up with the National Enquirer and David Pecker uh, the catch and kill process of Stormy Daniels' case. Stormy Daniel's story. It is not illegal to pay hush money to a porn star because you had sex with her and you, you, the violation of the law is creating false documents to cover it up for the election that's coming in a few months. That was supposed to be the October surprise in 2016. The election would have gone to Hillary Clinton if the United States had known about the hush money payments to Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump and his a lawyer at the time, Michael Cohen, and then his CFO, Alan Weiselberg, created these 34 documents to cover up that story by paying David Pecker and by paying Michael Cohen, who Michael Cohen paid Stormy Daniels, right? So this is the difference between the administrations that I want to highlight. The last couple, 40 out of 44 cabinet members that Trump had uh, appointed including his vice president, won't him endorse him in 2024. That's a huge difference in how somebody runs their administration. And the final point is Trump is surrounded by criminals. The people that he appointed to be his most trusted advisors are all now either in prison or going to prison. And I'll make a list. Steve Bannon, Paul Manafort, Peter Navarro, Michael Cohen, George Papadopoulos, Roger Stone, Rick Gates, Alan Weisselberg, have all been convicted of crimes and are serving or will serve time in prison. And before I jump to the, oh, I have more points here on my list. My list was more than a page long. I uh, Before I jump to the final two points on my list, 
The specter of prison has helped spur some of Trump's allies to flip on the former president and cooperate with prosecutors, specifically in the Arizona, the Georgia, and the Washington, D.C. case. Former Trump campaign lawyer Sidney Powell, one of Trump's co-defendants in the sprawling general election subversion case, took a plea deal to testify against co-defendants that helped her avoid prison. This is the person that he chose to be his campaign lawyer. So if we're looking at it, apples to apples comparison of the administration, this is the type of people that Trump surrounds himself with. Former Trump campaign attorney Kenneth Chesborough, another co-defendant in the Georgia case, also took a plea deal agreeing to testify at co-defendants trials. These people are flipping on Trump and the other co-defendants to save their own ass. Co a third co-defendant in the Georgia case, Scott Hale, Scott, Scott Hall, also accepted a plea deal agreeing to testify against others. All of that is from Axios. Not making that up. I spent all day yesterday researching this particular episode so that I could come to you and myself, advocate for myself with research, with facts. And then I'll close it out with these final two uh, points about uh, Trump's administration that we can reflect back on the debate and make an informed decision. He lied over 30 times during the debate. Politico has put out the fact checking in like rating them a moderate lie, mostly false or a pants on fire level of lie. And I'm going to be putting more and more and more out on TikTok because it is so relevant over the next four months to inform other people of what I've, what I've come to understand is reality. Mainstream media, corporate media are not talking about the most recent Jeffrey Epstein release documents where Trump is at least seven times noted. Corporate media is not talking enough about the, um, the lawsuit by Christy Johnson, Katie Johnson, that's coming back around. She was 13 at the time that she was, uh, that she reported she was assaulted by Tr Donald Trump. And then finally, the very last thing about Donald Trump's administration that we can compare to the Biden administration. He supports the, he supports the Heritage Foundation has spoken at one of their recent events. Here's the clip. Organization is named the Heritage Foundation because you understand that our glorious heritage is the foundation of everything we hope to achieve, which is why we need the help of the Heritage Foundation and everyone here tonight to get our tax cuts through the House, through the Senate. So watching that clip and hearing Donald Trump deny knowing anything about Project 2025 inspired me to go out, advocate for myself and do the research so that I could bring it to you and start this conversation around why advocating for our values and who we vote for is so important in November of 2024. Agenda 47 is what Donald Trump's 2024 presidential campaign calls their formal policy plans. According to the Trump campaign, it is the only official comprehensive and detailed look at what President Trump, <laughs> Freud can slip there, what President Trump will do when he returns to the White House. It is presented on the company's website in a series of videos with Trump outlining each proposal. And I watched these videos and I read the transcripts. And honestly, when he's talking about abortion, the transcript shows him saying way more about immigration and way more about the border than about abortion. Additionally, the proposals appeared to be aimed towards Republican primary voters and slowed down once his primary lead grew in April of 2023, to the point where Philip Bump wrote in the Washington Post in June of 2024 that neither Trump nor his campaign regularly brings up the plan. Although Trump's campaign initially embraced other ideas like Project 2025 as aligned with Agenda 47 proposals, Project 2025 has, as of June 2024, reportedly caused some frustration in the Trump campaign, which prefers fewer and more vague pro policy proposals to limit opportunities for criticism and maintain flexibility. I got this from Wikipedia. I know what people say about that source, but listen to that last line. line. Repeatedly caused some frustration in the Trump campaign, which prefers fewer and more vague policy proposals to limit opportunities for criticism and maintain flexibility. What does that sound like? It sounds like manipulation to remind his voters that he is 
leading them. He is the in charge of how they feel like they're a victim, but not ever talking about actual policy or what we're going to implement. If he keeps it vague enough before the election, then he can implement whatever he wants after the election. And if you look at the very end of his administration in January of 2021, he started the Schedule F process of terminating civil servants in the federal government. And that's a promise of Project 2025. And uh, John McEntee, who is the creator of Date Right Stuff, so he could stay relevant while he was waiting for Trump to come back in. This McEntee was the personnel director in Trump's first administration, who is also co-authoring Project 2025, who was recently, I'll play the clip here in a minute, who was recently uh, on a podcast talking about his involvement in Project 2025 and Schedule F, which if they are able to enact that part of their project, it will eliminate 50,000 civil servant workers, which alone could crash the economy. But not only that, but they're going to rehire anybody. Anybody who wants to apply can apply now. There's 4,000 appointees by a president, 4,000 to run the entire government. 1,000 of those, I think, have to be Senate confirmed. But 3,000 can start work day one. Walk through what you guys are doing. I know, and I keep asking. Do you work for Johnny or does Johnny work for you, right? But I definitely work for John. That's So what we're doing with Project 2025 is we're recruiting the MAGA America First Republicans right now so that we can take D.C. by storm in 2025. We're not going to go in like we did in 2017, where the establishment took over and co-opted much of the personnel of President Trump's administration. We're more prepared this time. We're recruiting grassroots conservatives. And we want all of you, if you want to serve in the next White House, next State Department, next Pentagon, we want you to sign up. Tell your sons, tell your daughters, tell all your friends. It's project2025.org. So, Johnny, okay, you heard that? If you guys want to serve, you've got to get engaged now. You've got to be involved now. Because one of the big parts of this is networking. It's not just training people up, but those networks that we do with grassroots organizations, with other organizations. Walk through, tell me what the plan is. So we're collecting resumes. We're getting as much information as we can now to save the transition time on the back end. As you know, when a president wins or president-elect wins, Things happen very quickly, and you have a short amount of time to staff an entire administration. It's also looking beyond the 4,000 and what we can do with the bureaucracy itself. So we're thinking of creative policy things as well that will integrate with this. Well, hold it. When we talk about that, let's talk about schedule. I mean, is there going to be a plan in place to start to take part the administrative state? There has to be, and yes, there will be. The next president, if President Trump gets back in there, he needs to reorient the government that's in a way that hasn't been seen since Franklin Roosevelt did it with the New Deal. We need to gut these agencies. We need to start from scratch. We need to make a new government, essentially, because the one that we have now doesn't work for conservatives. It wasn't made for us. It's built against us. So we have to go back to the drawing board with these agencies. If you are a mega uh, Republican, you can apply and become a federal civil servant. You're hired. You're not appointed. It, this is the first step in washing away 250 years of democracy and implementing Agenda 47 and Project 2025. Either one of those, whichever one you choose, is so much worse than the first administration. A coincidental point between Agenda 47 and Project 2025 is a vast expansion of the federal government's authority, particularly the executive branch, as expressed in the promise to reissue Executive Order 13957. The plans include constructing freedom cities on empty federal land, investing in fly car, flying car manufacturing. I don't know what Trump was talking about with planes who were running on electricity, but if this is what he was referring to, then it's vague enough that people are like, oh, well, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do that. We want flying cars. He's, in her, he's going to plan to introduce baby bonuses to encourage a baby boom, implementing protectionist trade policies, and over 40 others. 17 of the policies that Trump says he will implement, if elected, would require congressional approval, which is not great if MEGA stays in control of Congress, but we hope to have a blue wave coming up here in November. 
Some of his plans are legally controversial, which should be a red flag in and of itself, such as ending birthright citizenship and may violate the Constitution. And that's the person that uh, the Republican National Commi uh, Party wants to put in place and have on their ballot? Many of the proposals are contentious. One Agenda 47 proposal would impose the death penalty on drug dealers and human traffickers. I can get behind the human trafficker part, not public trials and public executions like he was talking about with Liz Cheney and Nancy Pelosi, as well as placing Mexican cartels on the United States list of foreign terrorist organizations, which I'm sure that there's another way to deal with uh, the Mexican cartels, which is something seriously to take into consideration. Trump also suggests deploying the National Guard to inner cities with high crime, which on that note, Crime is the lowest it's ever been under the Biden administration. And I'll get to all those statistics here uh, when it comes to the Biden portion of the debate and his administration. According to Philip Bump, some Agenda 47 videos appeared scattershot and responsive to current events around early 2023. So it's not as much an administration built on policy as it is an administration built on, I will handle your fear. And if you are afraid of people coming in from the southern border, I get it. Some of that is real. And you cannot lump a few into the majority. It has also been proven as a blatant lie during the, tr the debate that the immigrants coming across the southern border are not coming from mental institutions, prisons, or are straight up criminals. Statistically, I looked it up. I did some research. And I'll play that. I'll post that screenshot here in a second. Over 100,000 people have been stopped at the border who have a criminal record. So something's working, right? And that's the administration that we're currently under. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for staying with me long enough to listen to that. But I, it's so much more information than just that. But we're, we're comparing administrations today, and I do want to stay focused. So hear me out when I switched from Trump to the Biden administration. 2021 to the current. Did Biden do well at the debate? Hell no. Have there been re reports out there that he's only taking meetings and events between 10 and 4 p.m.? Yes, I've heard that. I mean, hell, even I'm not at my best at different times of the day. I am at my best from like 7 a.m. until noon. And that's when I actually schedule things into my calendar so that I can show up and advocate for myself at the best time of day. Scheduling a presidential debate at 9 p.m. Eastern for two people, 77 and 81, that's not smart anyways. That's not great for anybody, right? It's going to impact performance. And I can relate because I'm not at my best at 9 p.m. My bedtime's like 8.30, right? I wake up on my own between six and seven now. I mean, like I could officially be a morning person. And if that's how President Biden operates, I can relate. Now, is it going to be the best choice ever that our, our president may need be needed at 10 p.m. because of a crisis? Absolutely. That's something to consider. But that's why we're talking about the administration. The people that Biden appoints are certainly capable of handling that scenario at 10 p.m. with Biden, expecting that Kamala Harris is going to step up as vice president and step into the situation room at 10 p.m. That's not realistic. But we choose the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Biden chooses those people to be a part of his administration because he trusts them, not like Trump, who hires them and fires them within a month or two. I think near the end of his presidency, he replaced his attorney general two, at least two times because the current uh, William Barr was no longer agreeing with Trump's approach to the transition of power. Voting for Biden includes people like Kamala Harris, who stands up for women's health care and privacy. It includes the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, who is clearly a brilliant appointment and speaker. And, it, and as an overall and entire administration, not just Biden acting all solely on his own, but he chooses each and every person who's a part of it. So let's directly compare the administrations. And the top-ranked concern for Americans for the 2024 election is the economy. Let's take a look at the stock market really quick. There are three sources for economic prosperity that presidents are measured on, the NASDAQ, the Dow, and the S&P 500. 
Even though former President Donald Trump has been out of office for more than three years, he claimed credit in a January 29th all caps post on his social media platform, Truth Social, saying that his polling advantage over Biden is driving the stock market to new heights because investors are projecting he will win. I mean, come on. You haven't been in the presidential office in, in three years and you're claiming credit for the booming stock market. How narcissistic can you be? On ABC's This Week, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg countered that President Joe Biden, not Trump, deserves credit for the stock market rise. He says, he's quoted as saying, you know, most of us don't think that the stock market is an indicator of the economy. But if you do, because I know the former president does, it hit an all-time high under President Biden and not under President Trump, Buttigieg said March 10th. However, he was wrong about Trump's tenure. Trump saw stock market records set during his term also. That's not surprising for the S&P 500. Barring an economic calamity, most presidents see higher stock prices than their predecessor did. And if you look it up, Trump had higher stock prices than Obama, and Biden has had higher stock prices than Trump. That's how the market works. As our GDP grows, investment grows, and therefore the stock markets grow also. However, the administration has to maintain a level of consistency in order for the stock market to go up. There was a crash, a crash after Clinton built a surplus in the United States economy. We all got a refund check under Clinton because he built a surplus. And the next Bush that came in tanked, tanked it. There was not enough regulation on American mortgages. And we had this the mortgage collapse. Um, there were not enough regulation on big banks, and we had that collapse. The recession, 2008, hit everybody very, very hard, so much so that I chose to go back to school. And here we are, 15 years later. The stock market can be driven by investor perceptions, crowd psychology, rather than by economic data alone, which means that caution is necessary when using it to gauge the broader economy. Still, it usually has some connection to economic reality, and at the very least, many Americans have investments in the stock market, so the market's health can influence economic perceptions. Now, additionally, in the economy, the topic at hand is about wages, right? Wages relate to in inflation, right? I'm not going to discount that, but inflation is known to grow about 2 to 3% every single year, no matter what you do. Right. And in this particular day and age, people talk about inflation and how much their grocery bill has changed over the last two to three years. And I do want to remind you that so much corporate greed has been acknowledged in the last six months that that has more to do with inflation than anything else. And while inflation as a standard builds and grows at two to 3% per year, that's research and reported each and every year, wages is another thing to take a look at. There was a 9% increase in hourly wages under Trump from like 25 to almost 27 was the average hourly rate under Trump and a 14% increase in hourly wages under Biden, bringing it almost all the way up to $35 an hour as the average wage in America. But those 9% and 14% increases are important to acknowledge when it comes to a 2 to 3% increase in inflation every year. Jobs and unemployment is incredibly important in the 2024 election. During COVID, 9 million jobs were lost at the end of Trump's presidency. And the first year and a half of Biden's uh, presidency was the bounce back era. It was the era, it was the time in Biden's presidency where all those jobs came back. Right, the economic stability was there, so people started rehiring people that they terminated during COVID out of fear, and nine million jobs lost at the end of Trump, nine million jobs added in the first year and a half of Biden's uh, presidency, and since that first year and a half, Biden has added an additional six million jobs from 2022 until 2024, and in June of 2024, 206,000 new jobs were added. And finally, the difference in administrations, there's a recent presidential historian survey of 158, 159 uh, surveyed historians that ranked Trump dead last amongst all presidents, all 46 of them, and Biden was 14th overall. So let's just take that into perspective as we compare the debate side by side. How did they do? They both did poorly.
Neither one of those people showed up well that night. Trump lied over 30 times. Biden stumbled or mumbled or stuttered more than that. You know, he's made it this far with a speech impediment. You got to give him credit for that. As well as a quick reminder before I let you go today, Obama lost his first re-election debate to Mitt Romney. Lost. I'll put that in quotations because it's all about perception. Somebody can shout as loud as they want, say it as confidently as they want, but if they lie 31 times, the people who are convinced by the lie because it was spoken confidently and loudly, those aren't the people we want voting for. <laughs> well, those are the people that can continue to vote for Trump. There's only about 30 million of them, right? Or as somebody who tells the truth and stumbles and mumbles and kind of bumbles his way through it, I can actually relate to that because I'm not the best public speaker. I get super nervous. A lot of feelings of fear and shame show up for me when I'm speaking in front of people, right? So that's our last talking point on the comparison between Trump and Biden's uh, administration. We talked some shit today. We talked about how to set your intentions when you're showing up in modern dating. And then we also covered hinge prompts for the Enneagram type four. Hopefully you enjoyed today's episode. Please share it with somebody that you think would get a ton of value out of it. And as always, reach out to me on Instagram at the challenger podcast or on TikTok, Dave Doc Glazer. If you're looking for a little bit more support in your dating relationship and life journey right now until next week, wishing you happy health and happiness, wherever you're at in the world. Talk to you soon. The challenge we face today is that we are more connected to our devices than we are to ourselves and to one another. We are so distracted by instant gratification and access to information, images, and influence that we are numbed by it. Social media, porn, and dating apps have convinced us that we can have what we want whenever we want it, so we shrink inward. We are putting other people's needs before our own, and that leaves us feeling small and unseen in our partnerships. We put others up on a pedestal, which leaves us discounting our truest potential in life.